Genesis Church. Good morning, good people. We are so happy to have you here with us in-house and especially you watching us online. We want to remind you that if you are watching online on one of our three platforms, whether that be Genesis TV, Facebook, or YouTube, we have an online team waiting right now. We want to know who you are. We want to know where you're watching from. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We want to celebrate your praises. You can do all of that by just clicking on the comments and our online team is ready and waiting to greet you. So good morning. So it is August 8th and you know what that means? It's back to school Sunday. And I don't know, but I hear you parents cheering in the background. Some of y'all are ready to get rid of those kids and get them back to school. Or you homeschool parents, we're with you in prayer as well. And so it's Back to School Sunday here at Genesis Church, but it's also the beginning of a brand new series, Hold the Line. And so we are so excited to hear from Pastor Tim. It's been a while since we've heard from him, but he's back and we're gonna hear from him today as we launch our new series, Hold the Line. Like I said, it's Back to School Sunday and we have two back to school events that actually end today. The first is our Back to School Double Up Drive. And we have been asking you to help us gather some items for some schools, some parents, some kids, and some teachers in need. And that ends today. So even if you're not joining us in church, you can still show up before church ends with some items. But if you are planning on coming in, then this is the last opportunity for you to double up and bring in those back to school items that are gonna go to great use. Our other event that ends today is our back to school Brazil event, where we are asking 13 people to contribute $80 a month for the next five months. You can get on a recurring, um, recurring giving, or you can give all at once, that's $400. Both of the information for those events can be found at our What's Happening page at genesischurchorlando.com. But we're still not done. We wanna remind you that this Wednesday is Genesis night at Straight Street. And I know a lot of you, your heads are exploding. You're going, this Wednesday, it's also the first day of school. And we know, but we've simplified the menu. It's simple, baked ziti. That's what we're serving. And we still want you to come out and join us. So August 10th, again, Big ZD is the menu. Information can be found at the What's Happening page at GenesisChurchOrlando.com. We want to remind you how important it is because you are helping to feed the homeless and hungry in our city. And so that doesn't take a back seat. That doesn't go away when we have other things going on. And so this Wednesday, yes, August 10th, first day of school for many, is also Genesis Night at Straight Street, but we need your participation. So please, please sign up. And then next up we have to bat is Growth Track. A lot of folks have been brand new to our church since the last time that we've had Growth Track. And Growth Track is an opportunity for you to learn more about us and to learn about how you can be a part of all of the things that we have happening at Genesis Church. And so that's August 28th at 4 p.m. at the Ministry Center. You can actually head to genesischurchorlando.com and register at the Growth Track card. So right after the What's Happening page, is the growth track card and that's where you go to sign up if you haven't participated in that yet maybe you've been coming for a while and you're ready to consider membership growth track is where you want to do that and it almost skipped my mind but i got back i rallied i rallied folks august 14th that's next sunday is our back to school event for middle school and high school that's at 6 p.m here on campus for middle school and high school students it's superhero themed i don't know what that means but you can find out the details on the Genesis Students Orlando Instagram page, all right? That's where all that information is. But again, our middle school and high school students are gathering together. It's the first event of the school year. It's August 14th, 6 p.m., right here on campus. Superhero theme, get in or you miss out. That's all I can say about that. Well. We are happy to have you here with us today as per usual. Like I said, we're launching a brand new series called Hold the Line. It's something that's gonna be important for all of us as we're stepping into that new season of life with back to school, with schedules, with everything else. Pastor Tim's gonna be kicking it off in just a few minutes. So ready your minds, ready your hearts. Genesis Church begins in five, four, three, two, one. Let's go.
Father, we just thank you today. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, God, in this place. Welcome, Genesis Church, as we continue to worship our God, as we gather together, I encourage you just to lift up those hands and worship with us here today. Amen. Let's give him the glory. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have ruled me, but you just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak the word, it won't come to pass. Come on, church, you say, Great is your faith. Good morning, Genesis. 
I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you'll just grab a seat real quick. So welcome to, uh, to church this morning. We're so excited that, uh, that you are here, that you've chosen to worship with us. So uh, if you're in house today, um, I'm going to ask you to do something. So this week for, um, for a lot of people is, is a really big week. So uh, on Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday this week, there's going to be a, a lot of people that are starting a new schedule and a new routine. And so uh, what we want to do today is we just want to kind of pause and we want to ask any educator that is in the room. So if you are a teacher, if you are part of administration, if you work in a school in any capacity, or maybe you're a homeschool parent this morning, if you would do me a favor, would you just stand to your feet? Anybody in here like that? Okay. Amen. Yes. Can we make some noise for our educators? Stay standing. Stay standing. Got the tambourine coming in this morning. So listen, this is, um, this is a big week. This is a big week for you guys. And uh, some of you, you're going, to, uh, you're going to be taking a step into a place that you've not done before. Some of you are re-entering a place that you've been before. Uh, but you have an opportunity this week to, uh, to begin to make an impact in the lives of, of students. And so what we want to do as a church is we want you to know that we love you, that we are specifically praying for you this week. We know that this week can come with a lot of, of excitement, a lot of anticipation, but we also know that there could be a hint of fear as well about what's getting ready to happen. And so as a church, we just want to take a moment and we just want to pray with you, pray for you, pray over you this morning. So if you are standing, I encourage you stay standing. If somebody around you is standing, if you could do me a favor, would you just, if you know them, would you just maybe put your hand up on their shoulder, on their back? If you're standing by somebody, maybe grab their hand. If you don't know them, would you do me a favor? Would you just reach your hand out to someone around you that's standing? And I'm going to pray out loud, but I encourage every person in this room, I encourage everybody watching online to lift up our educators as they begin this week. Would you pray with me, dear God? Lord, we love you. God, we thank you so much for the men and the women that are standing. God, we thank you for the opportunity that you've given them, God, to train up a child in the way they should go. So, God, we pray that as they embark on a new journey this week, God, we pray that whatever campus they walk into, God, we pray whatever home that they're in, God, we pray that you would give them everything that they need. God, to give them the impact that you want them to have. God, we know that this week can be exciting. God, we know that there's anticipation that's building in their hearts. God, we know that there also can be some fear about the things that they may not be sure about. But God, we know that you can replace all of those things with your peace. And so God, we pray for peace over our teachers. God, we pray for peace over our educators, our administrators. God, my prayer, God, as a, as, a, as a pastor of this church, God, our prayer as the people of this church, God, is that they would see you this week. And God, that people that look at them, they would not just see a teacher, they would see you in that teacher. God, they'd not just see an administrator, they'd see you in that administrator. So God, we pray for discernment. God, for the choices and the decisions that they have to make this week. And God, I pray for each man and each woman that is standing in this place. God, I pray that they would know that they are loved by you. But God, I pray that they would know that they are loved by us. May we pray for them not just today, but this year. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Teachers, you may have a seat. Administrators. There's another group of people in here that uh, may be excited or may not be as excited as some of those. But if you are a student, whether you are elementary, middle, high, or college, would you stand to your feet? Any student in this place. There they are. <laughs> Students that are standing, let me explain something to you. This week, you're going to be stepping into maybe potentially a new place. Some of you will be stepping into a new school entirely. Some of you may be returning to the same school, but hopefully you're stepping into a new grade entirely. You got new teachers. 
new friends. We know that there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of preparation that you and your family have done, but this week is when it all begins. And so what we want to do as a church is we want to pray the same way we prayed for our administrators, our teachers, our educators. We want to pray for you. That God would use you this week, this year to accomplish all that he wants in you and through you. That you would not be swayed one way or the other, but you would walk towards him first. That you would seek him with all that you have. And that you would be a, a giant mirror reflecting who Jesus is. No matter what campus you fill, that's our prayer for you. If you're around one of these students, maybe one of those students belongs to you. I encourage you, put your hand upon their shoulder, their back. If you don't know anybody that's standing, but you see them standing, would you do me a favor? Would you just reach out, put your hand towards them? And as I pray out loud, I encourage you all to pray for our students, not just in this room, but students that are all over. Would you pray with me? Dear God, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for these students. God, we thank you for the elementary students. God, the middle school students, the high school students, the college students. God, we thank you for those that are going to, for continuing education. God, whatever they're doing, God, I pray that they would first and foremost, God, seek you. God, I pray that you would give them boldness as they walk on this campus. God, I pray that they would, you would give them courage as they make new friends. God, I pray that they would be giant mirrors reflecting your love. God, I pray that when people look at them, they would see you. God, I know that there's a lot of fear that can accompany something new. So God, we know that the student standing may be fearful. God, we pray that they would understand, God, that it is your peace that surpasses all understanding. God, I pray that at the end of this school year, God, the stories of life change, God, would run rampant. God, I pray that the schools, the homes, the communities that they find themselves in, God, I pray that they would be changed in Jesus' name. God, I pray that their friends that they have, God, would be changed in Jesus' name. God, I pray that you would help them make wise choices. God, give them discernment that can only come from you. God, we know, God, we know that you love us. And God, I pray that you would show your love to these students. God, I pray that they would seek you with all that they have. And we thank you that when we seek you, God, your promise is we will find you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's make some noise for our students. Amen. I'm going to invite you all to stand. I'm going to invite you all to stand across this place. And as we continue this morning in worship, I pray that it would not be just something that we start and end today, but this week, this month, this year, our students, our faculty, our educators, they'd be people that we pray for and pray with as we carry it the same way. Amen? Let's worship together. We exalt you, Father God. We lift up your name today. Holy is your beautiful name. Thank you, Jesus.
us, Lord, today, our ears to hear what you desire to say, to speak over us, the life that you want to place over us today. My God, open every heart here. That the room that we create, Father God, you can govern, you can take control, you can occupy that space now in this place right now, Father God. Shake up the walls of all tradition, all religion, and today that we may find relationship with you, relationship that will change our perspective, relationship that will change our thoughts, our views, and our lives. Right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you today. Jesus name you can put your attentions to the screens as we continue service at Genesis we love connecting with people are you new to Genesis Church would you like a free gift all you have to do is take a moment and fill out our digital connection card text the words Genesis Connect to 833-593-0340 and we will send you a link to that card as well as a link to a free gift. We believe generosity isn't just something you do. It's an attitude we have. God wants us to have a generous spirit and a generous attitude. Today, we don't have to give. We get to give. You can give online or on-site at our giving kiosk. And no matter which way you choose to give, remember, you don't give to a church. You give through a church. Genesis cares about family, and we consider church, community, and the people we do life with to be family. We serve our family by providing dinners for families with ministry meals, serving the homeless with Straight Street, or partnering with Commission 127 to serve families in the foster system with Families First and Care for them. Learn more by visiting Genesis Cares Kiosk in the lobby. So many things are happening here at Genesis Church, and we do not want you to miss any of them. An easy way to stay up to date is to scan the QR code on your TV or around the campus today and also make sure to follow us on all social media accounts and visit the What's Happening page on our website, genesischurchorlando.com. Now, before we get started, we had to do this in the first service. We have to address the most important issue in this place today. And that is the fact that Chad dressed exactly like me again. <laughs> We're going to have to call each other and say, what are you wearing now on Saturday night? So this doesn't happen again, but it happens quite often. That's what happens when you've grown up uh, together since you're in fifth grade. It is back to school week, which means if you are a parent or just a human being during this season, you're doing one thing in common with all of us, and that is grabbing as many schedules and calendars as you can so that you know how to plan. I am grabbing my daughter's school calendar. She's in fifth grade. I'm grabbing my college students' calendars, and I'm sitting with my wife, and we're laying them out so we know how to plan. My mom is calling me saying, hey, this is what our calendar is going to look like in the fall, what can we do to plan vacation to come see you? If you're in sports or arts or, or band, you have schedules and you have practices and you're gathering all that in, all these events. If you're a college football fanatic, an NFL fan, you're looking at calendars and schedules so that you know how to plan this season. We're all doing that. But I would dare to say what I have learned is that most of us go headfirst into this very busy season of life, collecting every schedule possible so that we can make every plan possible, but we have no spiritual plan or schedule for this season. There are a lot of us that aren't, e aren't even aware of why we would need one. If I said it's the most important schedule and plan you need this season, you would say, why? Like, I have a hundred other things to think about. Why would I think about that? And if I did, 
what would that even look like, and why do I truly need one? Well, Paul writes in this letter we're going to look at in a little bit, and he says that you are in a battle against something that is trying to disrupt and destroy your life. And if you do not have a plan and a schedule and a strategy in place for how you're going to face this battle, you are going to fall flat on your face in this season. Now, I will tell you this. This morning and in the weeks to come, as we begin this new series, for those that are here on site, for all of you that are watching online, you are going to have to evaluate everything you believe about God and his word. You are going to have to evaluate everything you believe about what it says and if it's true. And I don't mean that lightly. As a matter of fact, it's going to get heavy and it's going to get heavy this morning. Because you are going to be forced to evaluate what you truly believe about good and evil, light and darkness, angels and demons, the devil himself, and if there's a heaven that I believe in, then there's also a hell. And what I want you to know is this. Listen to me very closely. The enemy's goal, the enemy's goal is to advance and destroy you by any means necessary. The enemy's goal is to advance and destroy you by any means necessary. You, your marriage, your family, your home, your career, whatever he can disrupt and destroy, your grandchildren, they are all a target of the enemy. Now let me ask you this. If you were to leave here today, what would it be like if you could become aware that many of the problems you have faced or are facing in life are a direct result of spiritual warfare? What if many of the things you are facing in life are an absolute direct result of spiritual warfare? You're struggling with discouragement, mm. depression, mm, addiction, mm. divorce, anger, mm. all these things, greed, all these things that are, are, are a battle for your soul and your humanity, the person you are. Notice I didn't say this, so let me be very clear. I did not say all of those things are a direct result of sin in your life. I did not say that. What I said is it could be a direct result of spiritual warfare in your life. And we need to become aware of it so that we can battle against it and we can know how to plan for it. And so hopefully you've got all kinds of questions already because you're like, man, we just went. We went right into this. And that's why I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you're watching online wherever you stopped in your day to watch online with us. Because I hope that we can begin to answer some of those questions today and in the weeks to come. And so if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. As you came in the doors today on site, you were given a notes guide. We don't do that often. But it's an opportunity for you to take what you're learning so that you have the resource in your hand during the week. Some of you may choose, if you're watching online, to do that digitally. So there's a QR code on all the screens in this room, and there's one that's on your screen at home right now watching online. I encourage everyone to take out your phone and take a picture of that digital QR code because it will take you to a link tree that has a bunch of resources so that you have other things to take what you are learning with you throughout your week. There's a battle plan for prayer. There's a battle plan for worship playlist in your house. There's a battle plan for your family. Today in the lobby, there is a kid's devotional guide because what we're talking about goes from kids all the way to you adults in here. We paid 10 bucks for these. I think they're selling them just for $10. We just pre-ordered them so that you could get them today if you wanted to. If not, the link is on that QR code. You can get the Kindle version. You can get one delivered to your house so that you can go through this with your kids. But Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, although you may think that's the battle you're in right now, but against the rulers, against the authorities, listen to this, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Many of you might say, what are we doing and why are we talking about this? Because for a lot of us, anytime we talk about this stuff, you have this idea that it's fictional, sci-fi. It's something that I just see in TV and movies, and it's not real because it's invisible around me. I don't need to be aware of how it's affecting me. And what you need to know is this. You were created for one reason. The reason you were created is to bring glory to God, your creator. And there is an enemy in opposition who wants to do anything he can to get you away and to get you from bringing God the glory he deserves. And so today, we're going to do something maybe you have never done in your life. Maybe you've never sat in a church service or watched a church service where you have talked specifically about the enemy, Satan. Because if we are going to fight this battle that Paul is talking about, and we are going to become aware of this battle, then we need to know who we're up against. Going into my high school year, I was playing high school football, and one of our schedules was that before school starts, we had two-a-days. Two-a-days means you practice in the morning, and then you practice in the evening, two practices every day to get yourself really prepared for the upcoming season. What it really meant is that you were with the football team all day because you would practice in the morning, you would break for lunch, then you would come back, and before the evening practice, they would break you up into groups according to what position you played, and you would go into classrooms. I started on defense, and I was backup quarterback. And so I would split times in both rooms, but when I went into the quarterback room, they would hand me a binder, they would open it up, and inside this very thick binder was every play we were going to run during the season. And it was my job as a quarterback to memorize all the plays, where the linemen are going, how the receivers are running, where the running back is going, where I'm supposed to be. I need to memorize all this. And then they would give me another book, and it would have many of the schools we would be facing that year, and it would have all of their defensive schemes. And the coaches would tell me, you need to know where the opposition is going to be when we run these plays so that we can advance down the field. Now, I think about that, and I think about our life spiritually, that there's an opposition we're up against. And if we are going to advance, we need to know a little bit about him. And we need to know where he is and where he's going to be and how he's moving. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, you need to know about this enemy. The prophet Ezekiel writes about it in Ezekiel chapter 28. He says this, speaking about the enemy himself. Thus says the Lord God, you are a signet of perfection full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering. God says this about the enemy. He says, listen, you are almost perfect. As a matter of fact, you are full of wisdom and you are beautiful, which really debunks everything we think about when it comes to the enemy. Because many of us have this fictional idea like I do growing up watching Tom and Jerry, that there's the good angel on this shoulder and there's this little red guy with a pitchfork and horns on this shoulder. And if I just listen to the, the good voice and not the bad voice, then I'm, I'm okay and I can survive. Instead of understanding that God said, you had prominence. You had a role and a position. But here's what Isaiah tells us happens in Isaiah chapter 14. How you are fallen from heaven. O day star, son of dawn, how you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. Why was he fallen? Why was he cast out? It says this, you said in your heart, next side, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God, and I will set my throne on high. And I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north, and I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. 
In essence, Satan said, listen, hold on a second. I've got prominence. I'm full of wisdom. As a matter of fact, I'm beautiful. I'm good looking. Why is everyone worshiping you? They should be worshiping me. And so God says, hold on. There's only one creator. And he's the one that gets all the worship and all the glory and all the honor. You're not doing that. And he casts them out. Now, the enemy has many different names in the Bible. Some of them you're aware of. Some of them you've never heard before. The word devil appears over 30 different times in the scriptures. The name Satan appears over 50 times. But they're not just the two names of the enemy we are trying to identify so that we know that we're up against. He also carries the name tempter, serpent, Lucifer, prince of this world, deceiver, adversary, prince of the air, God of this world. Does any of this sound like anybody you want to interact or engage with? He carries many different names because he has many different schemes. And so he says, listen, for some of you, I will tempt you. And when I tempt you, you will give in to it. For some of you, I will deceive you because you don't know how to stand in truth. For some of you, I will be your adversary and I will be against you and I will battle you to the day you take your last breath. Whatever it takes to defeat and destroy you, that is my goal and that is my objective. You say, how do you know? Well, Paul, who has written this letter to believers in Ephesus, that's why we get the book of Ephesians, writes to another group of believers in Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says this, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So if you're here today, or if you're watching online, and you would admit, I don't believe in this yet. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I believe this. I don't know if I want to follow this. I'm very skeptical, skeptical about all of this. Now you know what's taking place in this invisible battle for your soul. The enemy says, I've been trying to blind the mind of those who don't believe to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. He does not want you to see nor hear, receive, be transformed, and follow this. From seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This is who the enemy is this is what scripture tells us, but I don't just want to talk about who he is. I want to talk about how to know how the enemy fights. How does the enemy fight? In the same letter to the book, to, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, it says, even Satan, listen to this, disguises himself as an angel of light. You know what that means? That means this beautiful, full of wisdom, fallen angel whose total goal is to get you to be blinded to the truth of God and who he is and what he wants to do in your life to keep you from far as possible giving him the glory and honor he deserves will do whatever he wants, however he wants to make you seem like it's not that big of a deal. It's fun. It's pleasurable. It's easy, shrug it off, don't pay attention to it, and you'll be okay. That is what it means by him being an angel of light. Because ultimately, if you don't notice what he's doing, you will accept what he's doing. Now listen to me. It's going to get real for a few moments. And it's going to get uncomfortable. And you're going to get upset at me. But your eternal, your eternal outcome is at stake here. And we care about that deeply. And so we will not hold back and we will not shy from the fact that there is a real enemy trying to totally destroy your life by any means necessary. There's an old Scottish proverb that says this, the devil's boots don't creak. The devil's boots don't creak. Meaning, he will find any way to slide himself in where you can't hear him, you can't see him, you can't notice him till he's already gotten to where he wants to be. 
Now, when we talk about this, there are a bunch of people in this place that were in the first service, that are in this service, that are watching online. And here's what you're thinking. I don't know anything about this spiritual warfare stuff. Like, I don't know how to recognize it. I don't feel it. I don't sense it. I, 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 don't, I don't notice it. Like, 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 what are we talking about? And so I would say this in all honesty. If you are not aware of the enemy at work in your life or in this world, you might be aiding his work or you are no threat to his work. Either way, it's a bad place to be. If you cannot identify the enemy at work, in this world, in our city, around you, and feel it and sense it, you might be aiding his work or you're no threat to his work. And we don't want to be in either place. Either place. You say, well, well what do you mean? In 2007, I was in West Africa. And I was with a bunch of pastors and a bunch of church leaders. And we were sitting with a pastor of the capital city of the country we were in. And he was telling us this crazy story about how a bunch of people from the town brought in this demon-possessed man and knocked on the door and shoved him in their home. And how him and his wife prayed over this demon-possessed man and released him of this demon, bathed him, clothed him, sent him out. And a few hours later, the people came knocking back on the door and they were asking all types of questions. This demon-possessed man we just gave you came out completely free and changed, and we want to know what happened, and he was able to invite them all in and share the power of God with them. And so we're sitting with this leader, and he's telling us about all these types of stories like this that are happening in villages all around him, and one of the pastors speaks up, and he says, how come you have all these stories like this here in this country, and we don't see nor experience them in America? And this very wise pastor of the capital city said this to us. He said, the devil is wise and works in various ways. In the West, America, he doesn't need demons to expose themselves because he has used distraction to do his work and it's easy for him. My God. My God. So over there in America, he's already getting to do what he wants to do because he just distracts you as if the battle isn't real. And because you don't think it's real, you actually allow it to happen. And so it's easy. He said, here in the villages, we've got witch doctors and witchcraft that are, that are casting spells and incantations and trying to say that whatever they worship and serve is mighty and powerful. And so God has to show up and say, listen, I am more powerful than all of that because there is only one God. But over in America, Satan has schemes and it doesn't mean he doesn't do that, but he doesn't need to do it as often because you're all blinded by the distractions all around you. And most of it comes in the way that you allow the enemy into your life or in your home, and you're not even aware of it. And you say, well, what do you mean? Well, a few months back, I was talking about this show named Lucifer that you can stream on a streaming network that has streamed for five full seasons it has an 88% like on Rotten Tomatoes. It tells us that this series alone is the number one ranking streaming original series of all time. Over 18 billion minutes have been viewed across its 93 episodes. It is a TV show literally entitled this is the enemy, and if I can get all of you in America to go, it's just a TV show. Why is it a big deal? But Pastor Tim, if you watched it, you would know that like there's good and there's evil and they're fighting each other and, you know, and, and all this stuff's going on. But it's about the enemy. And if Satan can say, listen, I don't have to do something crazy and mystical I can just get you to grab your remote and let me in because you think it's fun. Oh, that, that, that'd be much easier. I wouldn't have to waste much, much energy with that. And you would say, well, it's not just a TV show. We got categories. You can take your remote today and you can 
scroll through categories and you can come to one that says horror. And most of these episodes deal with something like incantations and dark shadows and demon possession and dark underworld stuff. And we go, but I'm just kicking back and enjoying a little entertainment with that. Because that's how a follower of Christ should be entertaining themselves when they truly understand that there's a battle going on all around us, a battle by an enemy who wants to destroy you by any means necessary. And so it's not just TV shows and movies. It's in music. There's a music artist whose number one billboard song, number one streaming song, and the music video depicts her as a black fallen angel to earth. And we just consume this stuff because everyone else listens to it. So I've got to listen to it and I've got to know about it. And it's in movies, it's in TV shows, it's in music, and it's in video games. Look at this. There's a whole category for the 20 best demon video games. It's just a game. Like, I'm the good one beating all the bad stuff. But we're entertaining ourselves nonstop with darkness. And some of us have not even woken up to the reality that we are letting this stuff into our lives, into our minds, into our homes, and we're having fun with it. While there's a whole world out there of people in other countries that are seeing unimaginable battles between good and evil. Now, I'm going to take for a moment some scripture, and I'm going to unpack it. And we're going to get a little more deeper into this so that you can match scripture with what's happening in today's culture and possibly in our own lives. Deuteronomy chapter 18 says this. God told those chosen people of his, there shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. Anyone who uses divination or practices witchcraft or one who interprets omens or sorcerer or one who casts a spell or a medium or a spiritist or one who calls upon the dead. He says, anyone who does these things, whoever does them is detestable to the Lord. He says, I don't want you messing with anything that fools around with darkness and evil. Any of those actions are detestable to me. He tells them later in, in, in the, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, you shall not eat any flesh with blood in it. That's awkward. That's gross. It's a little weird. And you shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes. Do not turn to mediums or necromancers, which are sorcerers. Do not seek them out. And so make yourselves unclean by them. I am the Lord your God. Two times God comes to his people and he says, I don't want you dealing with anything in this realm. Don't seek it. Don't mess with it. Don't touch it. Don't engage in it. Don't entertain yourself with it. And he says things that are kind of weird to us, like you shall not eat any flesh with blood in it. Why? Because he is the author and giver of life. And yet, through its first seven seasons, no other show on cable television has achieved the ratings as high, and this is an article title I'm reading, The Zombie Dark Drama of Walking Dead. Oh, hold on. Because you just, you, just, you just made me mad, Pastor Tim. Because I love this show. And I watch it all the time. A show that is about evil and darkness, zombies, that literally eat the flesh or bite someone to turn them into a dark soul zombie. But there's good guys. And the good guys are fighting the bad guys. You know what I've always found amusing if you're a parent? There's no parent on the planet that I know of that ever wants their kid to lose sleep constantly with nightmares. We will do anything to guard and protect our children and let them know they are safe when they are sleeping 
from anything playing in their mind. But we have a whole group of people and people in the church who put their kids to bed and tell them, none of this is real, don't worry about it, but I'm going to go down on the couch while you're sleeping with the volume up, and I'm going to allow all these sounds and all these monsters to fill my home. And this is how we live as followers of Jesus. But the show is over, and they're bringing it parts back, and I got to know, because my life won't be significant and meaningful and purposeful if I can't talk with everybody about the last episodes. I mean, I just feel like I'm all alone, and I won't know what to do with that loneliness. So let me just, let me just continue a little bit longer. You shall not interpret omens or tell fortunes or turn to mediums, which are witches and fortune tellers and spiritists and those who call upon the dead. Yet we watch all kinds of paranormal shows and activity of people calling upon the dead and we get amused by it and we get intrigued by it and we're curious by it. And the fastest growing religion in today's society is Wicca and New Age. As a matter of fact, the number of witches are on the rise dramatically in our country as millennials reject Christianity. I didn't write that. Newsweek did. And they could have just said the number of witches are on the rise, but guess what they said it was up against? Christianity. Anybody want to look at Paul and say, I think you are lying. I don't think there's a spiritual battle where the enemy is doing everything he can to get a foothold into our lives and into our homes. Some of you know, and some of you may not know, there's a famous tattoo artist in L.A., Kat Von D, has a TV show, L.A. LA uh, Inc. She was recently, just two weeks ago, making some Instagram posts about her life. She has been known for her dark designs, for her tarot-themed collection of clothing and makeup in which her lipstick is called witches and things like that. And then recently, though, this is what she posted as she is turning from darkness toward the light. In the last few years, I've come to some pretty meaningful realizations, many of them revolving around the fact that I got a lot of things wrong in my past. Today, I went through my entire library, which she posts a picture, are witchcraft books and Wicca books and books about healing stones and gems that we wear around our necks and all these symbols and things like that. She says, I threw those books out because they don't align with who I am and who I want to be. Now listen to this final part. The truth is, I just don't want to invite any of these things into our family's lives, even if it comes disguised in beautiful covers sitting on my shelves. Disguised in beautiful colors. Hmm, who would be willing to do that? The angel of light. So that you would just flippantly invite it in, put it in your house, allow it to have a place, and Satan goes, yeah, that was easy. And so he comes in subtle schemes, and sometimes he just comes head on. In Pennsylvania right now, there's a vote to allow a satanic school club in an elementary school. It has already been passed and allowed in an elementary school in Illinois. This is what the leader, listen to me, of the Satanic Temple said in his press release. He said, this is a nationwide, not a small area or town, a nationwide campaign. What's the campaign for? To push against the Christian Good News Club offered to children. He could have said, we're just trying to present our own club. No, it's to push back against the Christian one. And then he backs up to try to make it sound like it's just, you know, nice and not that big of a deal. He says, I'm hoping that our presence, that with our presence, people can see that good people can have different perspectives about the same mythology. 
Because if I can get you to believe that this isn't true, it's just a myth, Satan can easily do whatever he wants with you. Now, some of you are mad at me. Everybody would be mad at me by this moment. Just recently, 1.4 billion hours were viewed of Stranger Things season four. The Washington Journal wrote this article. Stranger Things goes full panic, satan- goes full satanic panic. I wonder what made them write that as the headline. Until you know that during the season, they were like, listen, in the 80s, all those Christians, they got all bent out of shape about rock and roll and sex and all these things. And they, 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 they were saying that the, that the devil was attacking everyone. And so we can mock that. Then we'll make everyone laugh at it and be like, yeah, back then people were just full blown, had lost their minds that there's this devil, this enemy trying to attack and destroy them. And if we can get people to mock and laugh at it, then they won't pay attention to it. If they don't pay attention to it, they won't take it real. If they don't take it real, they don't take it serious. If they don't take it serious, the enemy wins. And so what we'll do is we'll get a bunch of kids playing Dungeons and Dragons because that's one of the things they all panic about. Like, you know, because they they feel like it's leading to something dark. and, And we'll call it the Hellfire Club. And we'll get so many people to watch this and so many students that enjoy stranger things that then the culture will make t-shirts that they can't keep on the shelves so that they all walk around saying, I'm part of the Hellfire Club, just like on Stranger Things. And I look at that and I go, that's the very thing God sent his son Jesus to save you from. And we want to walk around because we want to pledge our allegiance to Stranger Things. And say, hey, I'm part of the Hellfire Club. Instead of, I'm part of the God of this world, creator of the universe, rescuer, savior, redeemer, the only one that can transform, renew, and change. I belong in his club. And I'm not giving a foothold to the enemy. You are either aiding or no threat if you are not aware of how the enemy is working right now. And there are a lot of you that would go, yeah, but listen, I spent days watching the first three seasons. Gotta know what happens at the end. Or my life isn't complete. And yet the very producers themselves, the producers said, we had to go darker because the kids got older. This is no more Ghostbusters and Goonies. That 80s nostalgia that we kind of liked about it. They tell you we're going darker. Okay, now I know what you're after. And I know who I'm up against. And I know what I've got to do. You got to know the enemy. You got to know how he fights. And you got to know when the enemy attacks. And if you're taking notes, I'm just going to hit these. Listen, he attacks when you're alone. So for all of you that say, I don't need the church. I don't need Christian friends. I don't need to be in a life group. I don't need to serve on a team. I can do this faith thing all by myself. It's exactly where he wants you to be. That's what he wants you to believe. The reason some of you drink more, you do it when you're alone. And, And the reason why some of you struggle with the depression you do is because you constantly live in isolation. You're not willing to take that courageous step, no matter how fearful it seems, to put yourself in the place you need to be. Some of you, the reason you are in the wrong relationship, doing the wrong things outside the confines of a godly marriage is because you're afraid that you'll be alone if you don't give in. The enemy will disguise himself in every way possible to get you alone. The devil will attack when you're vulnerable, physically, emotionally, mentally. That's why he wants you busy. Get as many schedules as you can and commit to everything. Because when you're exhausted and vulnerable, I'm coming to attack you. Because you won't make wise choices choices at that moment. 
The devil will attack you when you get serious about God. Teachers that just stood, faculty, professors, you're not teachers, you're not professors, you're not faculty, you're missionaries. You are to shine the light of Jesus in your environments and maybe be the only Jesus a kid or student sees this whole year. You are to be the alternative for everything else they can get in this present darkness and see the light and the hope that you possess through your craft and your skill. Students, you are not students. You are walking examples of light and darkness that other peers shall look at and go, why do you go different? Why do you go that way? Why do you choose that path? Why do you not do this? Because I belong to Jesus and I know what the enemy's trying to do. Tony Evans said this, like an opposing football team, the devil studies your game film. He knows your history. He knows your weakness and he knows your sin patterns. I don't. He does. Why? You're not his first assignment. He is good at what he does because he's been doing it since the beginning of creation. And if he was willing to attack and tempt Jesus himself, you can best believe he has no problem coming after you. This battle's real. This devil will attack you when you're in pain because when you're in pain, you'll look for a quick, easy fix through a substance, through a drink, through, through an opportunity, through financial gain, whatever it is, you just got to fix it and you'll make the wrong choice and he knows it. And then he will attack you when you struggle with identity, your marriage, and your family. I don't have time to get into that. We'll get into that over the next few weeks. But I want you to look at this identity. What is the greatest struggle our students are up against? Identity. Why do we have so many different identities and genders? Because they don't know where to land because they don't know where truth is. So just keep adding and adding and going and going until you figure it out. And hopefully you'll be happy at the end. But you won't be happy without Jesus. He will attack your marriage and he will attack your family. All of that is Genesis 1 and 2. You were made in the image of God. God ordained marriage. And God said you were blessed to have a family. And the enemy said, I will peel it all back and destroy all of it if I can. That's how he works. And so you got to know this today. How do you hold the line? And military, when the enemy is advancing, your job first and foremost before you can advance is to hold the line. And say, not in my faith, not in my marriage, not in my home, not with my grandchildren, not in my career, not in my church. The enemy advances no more. We will lock down and we will stand firm. Listen to me. Some of you have to understand this truth. Satan is not the opposite of God. He is the enemy of God. He is not the opposite. Well, there's, there's black and white, dark and light, good and evil. No, he's the enemy of God. Now let's close here because I want to give you some hope. Because I can tell you, I can look all around and go, this world is hell bent as it possibly can be. Because the enemy has been advancing and winning for far too long. Satan is not afraid of any of you. He's not afraid of me. That's right. That's right. But he's afraid of the Jesus in you. Yes. He's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of Jesus in you. Why would he be afraid of Jesus in you? In 1 John chapter 3, it says, Practice righteousness so that you may be righteous. He who keeps on sinning is of the devil. Why? Because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And the reason, listen to me, the whole reason you are here, the reason we are doing what we're doing, the reason we are talking about this, the reason God sent his son Jesus was to destroy the works of the devil. The whole reason is to destroy the works of the devil. And if that's the reason Jesus came, then why would you ever open your door of life to be entertained by it? in any way possible. And the reason he's doing that is because he knows. He knows the ending of the story. He knows he loses because there is only one God and only one creator. 
He wanted to be like the Most High, but he isn't. And at the end of this story, it doesn't mean discount it. It means stare it right down the line and take it serious. It says the dragon, the great dragon, was thrown down. That ancient serpent who is called the devil, Satan. Why was he thrown down? Because he was the deceiver of the whole world. Not just Orlando, not just your home, every home, everywhere. The devil has come down to you with great fury. He hates you. He hates you. He hates you. Because he knows his time is short. He's going to be out of time. When it's all said and done, his whole objective is to get as many people as he can to follow him towards a path of destruction, eternally separated God from forever. His mindset, I got to be there. I want as many of you coming with me. So keep laughing about it. Keep playing it. Keep watching it. Keep listening to it. Keep entertaining yourself with it. Keep saying, I don't know how to discern and be aware of the enemy because you'll just make it easy for me. Now at the bottom of your notes, there's a filter because here's what's going to happen. You're going to bum rush me at the end of the service or you're going to email me, text me. You're like, Pastor, can I watch this? Listen to this? Do this? Dress like this? Decorate this? Be here? Like, like you know, what do you do? What, blah, 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 blah. Here's my filter. Whatever I'm doing, does this glorify evil, evil, darkness? Does this bring fear through evil to me or to someone around me or into my house? Does this create an opportunity for me to be entertained by evil? Does this open the door for evil in my home? Dads, you're biblically responsible to lead your home spiritually. Moms, you're biblically responsible to lead your home spiritually. Does this contradict God's desire for me to flee from evil? Resist the devil, the scripture says. And he will flee. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Know the enemy. Know how he's fighting. Know how he will attack. Hold the line. Now, here's what we're going to do to end out. The battle line has been drawn. Paul said, stand firm. Stand firm. Do not let the enemy advance. And so I'm going to call some of you forward right now. Teachers, he will not advance in my classroom this year. Moms and dads, he will not advance in our home. Husbands and wives, he will not advance in our marriage. Those of you that are dating, he will not advance in our relationship. It will be clean and pure to honor God so this faithful God will honor us. We are drawing the battle line to say we will stand firm in our faith. This will be a church that will lock arms. We will fight this battle. We will face it head on. We will say you will not entertain us. You will not get a foothold here. You will not get to make us take you easy or lightly or to bring you in to laugh at it, to scoff at it. We're sending you out the door. For we will stand firm in our faith. And some of you, listen to me, some of you better not leave this place today till you repent. And I know that sounds harsh to some of you. Just say, God, I didn't take this battle serious. And I can see where the enemy has gotten into my life or into my home. And right here before I leave, I am making a commitment that when I get back, that door, that door shut. And it ain't getting any longer. So that's you. I'm just inviting you to come. Come stand at the altar. Come kneel at the altar. Come pray. Come right now. Come grab your spouse. Come grab your kids. Whatever you need to do, just come forward at the steps. Come down here, down front. Come and do whatever you need to do. But I want you to pray because it says the battle belongs to the Lord. Pray in the power of the Spirit of God that you can you can fight against the weapons and the warfare of this enemy. Hold the line. Hold the line. Do not let it advance any further.
this week, there have been people, teams, specifically praying for you. All this morning, some of my own family members that don't live here knew what we were going to be discussing and said, we're dialed in praying because we know that when you talk about the enemy, he doesn't like it. You now become a threat. And every person who's drawing a line right now, if you weren't before, you are now. And he knows your weakness. He knows your struggles. He knows how to tempt you. He knows how to disguise himself. He knows how to do whatever he needs to do to get himself a foothold in your life, in your home, in your marriage, and in this church. And we are seeing, starting this season, this year, when we talk about lacing them up, this is what it means. There's a battle, and we're going to fight it. We're not going to shy away from it. We're not going to cower back. We're not going to address it. We're going to meet it. Because we know the greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. And so may you today know this. May you know and be aware more than ever before that the enemy is alive and active looking to kill, steal, and destroy. May you know that you have an advocate, the very spirit of God living in you that he is terrified of because it's the spirit of the living God who is greater than him, whom he knows the ending story to. May you go home today and remove things that you've allowed the enemy and aided the enemy into your home, into your life, into your mind, into your heart, into entertaining you. And may you with all of us hold the line. Grace and peace. May God be with you.